Read verses 15 through 17 again of 1 John 2. This is, these three verses will be the verses that will be preached tonight. 1 John 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. May the Lord bless the reading, and now especially preaching of his holy word. Well, to come to the Lord's table, you are declaring that you want to be found in heaven. That you want to be found in heaven with the Lord of heaven. That you want to be with him, and you are desirous to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That you would say, let family go, let goods go, let this world go, if it means that I will be with Jesus. All who come to the table, that must be found in their heart, this principle that they want to be in heaven with the Lord of heaven. They are the ones who say with the psalmist, whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none on earth that I desire but thee. That's the heart of the one who comes to the Lord's table, or rather it ought to be. Now I'm well aware that many come to the Lord's Supper who don't have that principle in their heart, and that is meant to be warned against. That if you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't love him over the world, then you ought not come until you repent and you trust in him. And you say that even though I struggle with my love for Jesus, right? Our love for Christ is never what it ought to be. And we remember hearing that in our preparation for communion uh, season sermon series, that it's a wonderful thing that Jesus Christ didn't ask Peter the question, Peter, dost thou love me as I deserve to be loved? But instead he just asked, dost thou love me? Because what man can truly say, I love Jesus Christ as I ought to love him? However, we are to love the Lord of heaven and we are to have even the desire to say, let this world go if it means that I will be with Jesus. We are to have the longing the Apostle Paul had, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. That's what the Christian says when they come to the Lord's table. And I suppose this all resonates with us, doesn't it, children of God, when we are most spiritual. We were most spiritual. But the problem is, too often, the world has a competing seat in our heart, doesn't it? And so we often find ourselves, though we might profess with our mouth and when we're at our very best even, that we would desire to be with the Lord, the world pulls us away. And often we are away from the Lord far too often. And though we profess with our mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, our heart is often far from him. And it is because there are many things that can steal our heart away from the Lord, but perhaps today what has most snatched away the hearts of Christian folk is the world. And it's nothing new, of course. We find the warning here in the scripture. But today, so often Christians live as those who are of this world, Though Jesus said, you are not of this world. The world is stuck in our hearts. It's always on our minds. And we don't have the sensibility to see that it is crowding out our desires, our pursuit, and our love for Jesus Christ. And as we had read in James, it is enmity with God. James calls it spiritual adultery, right? And isn't that fitting when we think of the Lord's table? We're saying we are coming to our beloved. And when he says, when the scripture says that to be a friend of the world is enmity with God and it is adultery, that ought to 
strike something in us. I cannot be a harlot and come to the Lord's table. If I've been, as it were, forgive the expression, fornicating with the world, then it is hard to understand how I can come and say, I am the bride of Christ and I am coming to commune and sup with and on my beloved. And so tonight, what we ought to do as we prepare for the supper, we must examine our affections particularly as we are plagued with worldliness in our society as Christians, often insensible to it, to the point that if you want to live for the Lord, if you want to live in holiness, good Christian people will call you legalists at times. It's a shocking thing. There's so much worldliness where they will say, who are you to tell me I can't watch R-rated movies? Right? I mean, this is where the church is. And we have to see that the world has intruded too much into our hearts. And we come to humble ourselves before the Lord, admitting our own sin. Now I've used the examples of others, but tonight this is about us and the Lord. We need to come before God and admit where we have been worldly ourselves. And you remember in James 4, for your encouragement, even as we come to a hard text and a hard sermon perhaps, The way to exaltation in God's word is to humble yourself. The way to nearness with God is to go low. It is to bring the dross. It's to bring the uncleanness. It's to bring it all to him and say, God have mercy on me, the sinner. And it is that one that the Lord lifts up. It's that one the Lord embraces. It's that one that the Lord says, come you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So let's examine our love for the world, and it may prove uncomfortable, and trust that the Lord will minister grace if we are humbled. So three heads tonight. First is desire. Second is prognosis. And third is vivification. I'll explain those a bit more as we go into them. First is desire, and we'll spend most of our time here. And as we open up verse 15, we see that it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now in that verse, you can see the word love is used several times. In that, what we have to remember as we look at the the idea of love here, is that love is a key and critical component of our faith, isn't it? Of our religion. Love is a key component of it. The greatest commandment, Jesus said, is couched in terms of love. The reason for that is that the Lord has given us a heart and its affections steer the course of our soul. And so you think about this as you look at these two competing principles here in this verse. If your affections are set on the world, your soul, its affections are going to steer you in an earthly direction. If your affections are set on Jesus Christ, you are steered in a heavenly direction. That's why Colossians 3.2 says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Now, There are sometimes, there's a strange idea that the commandments of God are at variance with feelings. Here is a commandment from God to set your affections on Christ. That's his command. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And so you can't say to the Lord, well, I'm just not feeling it. Right? That's how our society often speaks. I'm just not feeling it. God says, set your affections on heaven. It's my commandment. Now, of course, what he commands, we have no power in ourselves to drum up, and we must ask him for for it and the grace to do so. But let us never say, and children, you're in a society now that says your feelings, unmoored from the word of God, ought to guide you. But the word of God actually guides your feelings, guides your affections, guides your loves. 
you know, the world says love is love, right? That's the new thing. That's old, really. We are to love the Lord our God. We are to set our affections. And so the battle of the Christian life is for the mind, yes, but also the affections too. And we must understand God must conquer our affections. The reason for this, and perhaps even um, our elder here today can attest this to you, I cannot tell you how many times you minister to a person, you point out plainly what the word of God has to say, right? And they will even parrot back to you what the scripture says, yet they will walk away from it. Why? Because their affections are being set against the truth. And they haven't brought their affections in line with it. We need to love God. We need to love his word and we need to follow it. Our affections ought to be for the word of God. Now, that principle set, you notice that in this verse, there are two conflicting loves. The love of the world and the love of God or the love of the Father. And these two are contrary. They're like oil and water. They cannot cohabitate. One pushes out the other. Love the world and the love of God, the love of the Father is pushed out. Love God. This is the hopeful part if you struggle with worldliness. Love God and the love of the world ought to be pushed out. Right? These two are contrary. So the apostle tells us not to love two things in this verse. First is the world, and second, the things that are in the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. We can divide these two up. He draws a distinction. So let's consider them in turn. Let's first consider what scripture means by the world. Love not the world. Now generally, there are four ways that scripture speaks of the world. And each is worth considering. And the first is, especially children, if you're taking notes, I'll go a bit slow here. The world as the created world. Then second, there is the world as the unbelieving world. Third is the world as the customs of the world. And fourth is the world as the benefits of the world. So there's the created world, the unbelieving world, the customs of the world, and the benefits of the world. Now, I want to treat each of these in turn because Christians are affected by all of these. So first, not to love the created world above the Lord. Now, it's common in the heart of man to worship the creation above the creator. Romans 1.25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, maybe about 40, 50 years ago in a Christian church, this would have been plainly obvious, and you would say, well, you can get through this really quickly. But today there's been a revival of paganism and pantheism. The worship of the earth, the worship of the universe, to worship and adore Mother Earth, Mother Nature, rather than the God who created it. This is how our society is speaking more and more. It'll even speak of the universe. The universe has blessed me. The universe will show me what to do. There's been a revival of this. I have, um, as I have um, in my other vocation, a lot of work done in computer science, it is shocking to me how many computer scientists are speaking in this way. The, the world has become more and more paganized here in the West. Or you will even hear Christians say, professing Christians say, I would rather be out in nature than come to church. I worship God in nature. There's a sense there that you would rather worship and serve the creature more than the creator. And maybe you're not tempted by that in this room. But is it not true that our society is consumed with created things? We long for possessions. They consume our thoughts and our minds. And we even say, oh, if I could only have such and such, then I would find satisfaction. And maybe you're thinking of something like that right now. If I could have this thing, 
children. And especially as you're growing up, you might think to yourself, if I had that item or that device or that car or that house or that property, then I would be satisfied. Then I would find my heart's longing. You know, there's, what I don't mean by that is there are things in this world that can please us and that's the goodness of the Lord. But there is a craving that turns into a covetousness of the things of the world where we put our hopes and we put our satisfaction in those things. And that's why the Bible calls covetousness idolatry. It displaces the place God is to have. You know, what you find is less and less satisfaction in the Lord and more and more satisfaction you believe you will possess when you possess a thing. You'll find that in your soul. You're consumed with things and material things. And in this society as well, we have to be aware. There is such a thing as Madison Avenue. And they're very good. Very good. The year before, you were very happy with your iPhone 15. The next year, a man gets up on the stage and suddenly you're losing your mind saying, I've got to have the next thing. And you're no longer satisfied with that prior device. You see, the world is very good at grabbing your affections. Whereas the immutable God has been there all the time, the one that you can find full satisfaction in, and you haven't been finding satisfaction in him. That's worldliness. And that's the created order coming into your heart, an addiction to the things of this world. If you think your happiness is there, that's worldliness. And friends, if you've lived any length of time In this world, I use the iPhone as an example because it's a pressing example. But you would see the folly of it, wouldn't you? If you actually went back in your life and you go back and you think, okay, 10 years ago maybe, I thought if I had this house, then I would be happy. I get the house and suddenly I find more misery. Or maybe it's not misery, but it's apathy. I just don't care. It didn't fill that void in my heart that I thought it would. No, junkyards, children, are full of what men once treasured. Think about that. That junkyards are full of what men once treasured. There is no satisfaction found in loving the creature more than the creator. And we must think that way. And the Bible says, if you have Christ, you have everything for contentment. If you have food and raiment, if you have food and clothing, let us be content. Because you have the pearl of great price. You have that treasure hid in a field. And so that's the world as the created world. Second, there is the world as the unbelieving world, which is set against Jesus. John 15, 19 speaks of the world in this way. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, and so this is that unbelieving world we're speaking of, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Now, I'll get to how completely irrational it is to love the world. But if you're a Christian, it is super irrational because the world hates you. And the unbelieving world hates you. And it's a strange thing for you and I to pursue what hates you. There is meant to be natural enmity between the unbelieving world and the Christian. Friends, you are not to love that world. We distinguish, right? We are to love the world in a certain sense, right? We love the souls that are perishing. We do good to all men. We love our enemies, even the Lord has said, but not in a way that puts affection there that puts desire there. To be as Lot's wife, right? To love the world and its people, that our love for the Lord and his people is displaced. Remember this, children, when it comes to the unbelieving world, especially if you're ever tempted, right, in any way to to seek to marry one who is an unbeliever, the unbelieving world doesn't love you. It doesn't. It doesn't love you. It is at enmity with you because it hates the Christ that you love. So you must not find your desires set upon ungodly men and ungodly institutions of the world. This extends not just to individuals, but also institutions. 
You know, men actually find a lot of worldly pride in belonging to institutions set against Jesus. Men find a lot of adoration for institutions set against Christ. Right, I'm going to talk about the right use of patriotism, but our flag and its anthem stirs the affections of God's people at sporting events more than when the Bible is read and the Psalms are sung. Isn't that a strange idea? That there is more affection set on, you know, there, there are men who will pledge themselves to that flag and are less likely to find their souls stirred by the reading of God's word and the singing of psalms. But when the national anthem is sung, suddenly their affections are overflowing. There is a certain love for the world in that that we have to understand is not right. When it overextends the things of God. And again, I said I want to be careful. Honor for institutions is proper. Render honor to Caesar that is due to Caesar, but not above our affections for Jesus. Today, worldly institutions in our societies, uh, society actually includes companies. We live in such a perverse time. Let's think about this, that you cannot criticize a person's favorite band or company or sports team without feeling like you have offended them personally. Even among Christians. Without thinking that you have not, maybe go beyond that, not that you have offended them personally. As it is as though you have offended their God. That's how deep the hooks of the world have penetrated our hearts, friends. And it's so subtle, isn't it? That we don't even pay attention to it when it's happening. Here's an example. I'll use tech again, because I'm a tech person. But I don't have an allegiance to any particular tech company. I tend to use what I need to use at the moment. One day you might find me using a Mac. One day you might find me using a PC. Another day an Android phone or an iPhone. Yet I will get flack even from Christian people. Now, that sounds trivial, but there's a heart problem here. From even Christian people, because I'm not using their favorite company's device. And I remind them, I have one religion. I have one faith to evangelize. And it is not your company and their product. And again, it sounds silly, but there's a fervency there. You cannot get that same person to go door to door with you evangelizing. But they're ready to point out why their phone is better than yours. So we need to see that these things are pervasive in our company and our affections are set on companies, institutions that we ought not. And let's remember, it wasn't too long ago what happens during Pride Month. All these companies and brands and governments that we profess love for turn their logos into LGBTQ stuff. They hate the thing that we profess to love. And they will hate you. You are not of the world children of God. Therefore, the world hateth you. So why would we put our affections on that which hates us and our Lord most of all? So that was the world as the unbelieving world. And again, you could have a whole sermon on each of these. But third, we're not to love the customs of the world. That's what the apostle speaks of in Romans 12 too. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Think about the ways of the world. Think about the way, uh, the way that the world thinks and the manner of speech of the world. Think about what the world is all about. Pleasure and hedonism chased after. Drinking parties and entertainment as desire. Coarseness of speech. Blasphemous words and those kinds of thoughts adopted. Lewdness celebrated. These things have their source in the world. For instance, a couple of scriptures that give you a snapshot of what the world's customs are like. Romans 13.3, let us walk honestly, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering, that's lewdness, and wantonness, that is lust, not in strife and envying. You see, this is the pattern and the way of the world. 1 Peter 4.3, speaking of our former times, we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, that's excessive feasting, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. 
What's common to the world is the gratification of the flesh, to live for pleasures. That's the course of the world and its entertainments, pursuits, and its customs. Just look at it. As as the Christian influence has grown less and less in this society, look at the world's customs and where they are going. You cannot go to the grocery store without seeing women who basically are not wearing anything. There is no modesty anymore. The men, what comes out of their language, every other word is filthy and coarse. These are the customs of the world. You look at the entertainment of the world, purely to gratify the flesh. Right? The Lord's name is taken in vain, even in ch- ostensibly children's entertainment. And sometimes we indulge in these things because we want to be a part of the world. We don't want the world to think we are those weird Christians. I covered that in our sermon on holiness. We are going to be weird in the eyes of the world. Worse, we are going to be hateful in their eyes, aren't we? Because we stand for things they hate. We stand for righteousness. We stand for holiness. And that pricks them, that convicts them, and they're going to have an unholy hatred for you in response. It's a fool's errand, children, to try to make the world love you. The only way that's going to happen is for you to give up Christ. They will push you and push you and push you to the point where the only acceptable compromise you can make at the end of the day is to give up Jesus. I once worked with a Christian man. He went to drink, drink, uh, drinking parties because he did not want to be isolated at work. He wanted to hobnob and he wanted to be able to know that he could advance his career. He wanted to be one of the guys on the team. And he would also indulge himself in television shows that his co-workers would watch so that he could be part of the conversation. What was the root of it? Love for the world. Love for the world. And when I left that company, he was scarcely a Christian if he was at all. A terrible effect the world had on his soul. And these things are subtle. right? They happen in little degrees, and we're caught unaware because there is so much of the world that pulls at our soul. Even consider the fashions of this world. Ask yourself, why is it that I will decide to dress the way I do, why I associate with certain brands or clothing or ways of presenting myself? Is it because this is what is popular in the world And I just want to fit in. I want to not be seen as out of the loop, right? Or is it truly because this is a modest piece of clothing? It's a good piece of clothing. It may even be from a popular brand. That's not the point. What's the root desire, though, in what you wear? And why is it that you will decide, oh, you know how many people have said something like this, even in my earshot? Those people, why are their skirts so long? Right? And there are so many young ladies who will not wear long skirts because they are strange to the world or they think that, oh, this person must be Amish or something. But that's going to be a love for the world that's going to tempt you in that way, young ladies. Right? When you start thinking that way, I'm embarrassed of modesty. So boys and girls, both, you will be tempted to do certain things just because it is popular in the world. And sometimes there might not even be something unlawful about it in God's eyes, but if your motivation is the reason you are doing it is you want to be loved by the world and seen by the world, then it is sin, if that is your motivation. Because we are not to love the world. And by making that choice, that decision, even for something lawful because it has something to do, some principle with uh, loving the world, that is sinful. 
So we always have to ask, why do I make the choices I make? That in itself can show us the lawfulness or unlawfulness of an action. And so let's ask ourselves that. Let's examine our hearts this week, these next few days, before we come to the table on our decision-making. So that was the world as the customs of the world. Fourth, we're not to love the benefits of the world. Now, I've covered a little bit of this already, but I want to hone the point here. Sometimes we love the world because we love what it can give, right? Riches, honors, pleasures. Covetousness is idolatry, Colossians 3.5. The thing about idolatry is this, and we have to remember this, is that men do not actually love the idols for what they are, but what they imagine they can give, right? That's why you have in pagan societies, I grew up this way, what was the favorite god of my parents? Lakshmi, the god of wealth, right? There was nothing, this is so different from the Christian faith. We love God for who he is, right? That's why we adore God. If he gave no benefit, no salvation to us, we are still bound to love him for who he is. But idols are loved because of what they can give. That's why so many pagan gods deal with fertility, deal with wealth. Israel did not chase after Assyria's gods because they liked their gods, but because they lusted after what Assyria could give, power, protection, and so on. And that's why I think as well there is so much anxiety in God's people because we have the cares of the world and we pursue what the world has to give. We are anxious when we don't get it and it chokes our spirit. And it makes them forget the word of God. Mark 4.19, And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. You see, so much anxiety, not all of it, but so much anxiety, child of God, is from loving the world and what it has to give. Rather than seeing God as your provider, who provides all you will ever need, most of all, his own son. So James 4.4 4 reminds us, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. These are weighty things, weighty words. We don't dare take them lightly. We've considered four ways that the world is spoken of in the scripture. And in all of those areas, if we start to chase any aspects of the world, it is spiritual adultery. And we will find ourselves the enemy of God. And the Lord asked, what does it profit a man to gain the world and to lose his soul? What profit? If you could have everything in this world, children, what profit is there for you? Only misery and death. Ask any believer who has had their total fill of the world. Ask Solomon in the scripture and has come to Christ. There is no profit in the world. Right? We delude ourselves into thinking if we could just have the world, we would be happy. But the world is so deceitful. It promises everything, but it destroys your soul. Just the other day, I think within the last couple of days, another celebrity found dead, jumped off a third-story balcony. A young man had everything that the world had to give, record deals, women, money, pleasures. But he seems to have lost it all. And it led to despair, and now he is dead. Because here's the other thing about the world. What the world gives one day, it will take the next. There's no security in the world. Absolutely none. No security. There is no covenant that the world will make with you. There is no covenant. There is no giving of itself to you. It gives no cup to you saying, this is the New Testament in my blood, unlike Jesus. And so we have to ask, why is the world so good at snatching our affection away from Christ? 
We are to enjoy the good things of this life. We are to enjoy a competent portion of them. They come from our Lord, and we must see that, who delights to give us good things. But we always treat the things that we receive in this world, so to speak, as icing on the cake, given in love from our Lord's hand. So we are to hold on to the world and the things of this world loosely as we hold on to Christ tightly. So that's what's meant by the world and a call to not love it. But remember, John distinguishes between the world and the things in the world. What does he mean by the things in the world? The definition is found in verse 16. For all that is in the world, and then he gives you this list, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. He says you are to be aware of the source of three things you struggle with, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are of the world. They're the effect of loving the world and the world on our souls. And if you understood those four ways we have seen the world in Scripture, you will see these lusts, we've even spoken of them already, and the effects on us. The lust of the flesh is found in things as gluttony, drunkenness, fornication, and so on. Sins by which we gratify our flesh and not the spirit. Even you hear of the excess use or perversion of good things, the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes is our longing gaze set on the world. Covetousness. The pride of life, I haven't treated this so much, so I'll treat this briefly, is your carnal esteem of yourself. Your own desire for self-exaltation. And who are you trying to please? The world. Right? To show you something of that you are something in this world a desire to have others see you a desire to have others praise you a desire to have others esteem you that needs to be put away by god's help you and i are called to wage war on the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life so we could have a whole series of sermons just on this verse, as you can see. But the idea tonight is to start to provoke your spirit, that you might do a work of examination and see where these things have intruded in your heart. And here's the thing. Every time you find these intrusions, it's pushing out the love of God. It's enmity with the Lord. So mortify these things. And bring these things to the Lord as you find them. As you heard last night, turn us again. Take what you find in my heart, O God, and turn my heart away from the world into Christ. The world is too strong for you. The world is too strong for me. But you say to the Lord, Thou art almighty, and Thou hast power over my heart, and Thou is mightier than the world. And so the next two headings... I will consider will be a bit more brief. But the second is to help us in examining our heart a bit, and it is the heading called prognosis. So to help in our repentance over the next couple of days, that the Lord would kill our love for the world, I want to give some diagnostics I found helpful in the examination of this sin, that the Spirit might pluck it out. These are not original to me, but general counsel that you often find in this area. And the first thing that you want to examine is your thought life and how worldly it is. Where are your thoughts? When the world fills your thoughts, right? This is that principle of exclusion. When the world fills your thoughts, Christ is not present there. That's the love of the world. When you think about these things, right? When you wake up, and I'm not saying that any of you do this, this is though very common, when you wake up and you power up the phone and you start scrolling through it and you have yet to open your Bible and you have yet to pray and even that as you have spent all that time on the world through your phone, the time for prayer in the world has slipped away, you're finding that your thoughts are set upon the world and not on the Lord. Then in the evening you come home and you turn on the TV and you flip through YouTube and not for necessary edifying reasons. And you say, now I'm too tired to pray and seek the Lord. I'll just go to bed. 
your thoughts have been filled with the world. That's what's been on your mind. It's not been the Lord. So do you find that your day begins with the world and ends with it? That needs to be changed. And if you change that, it will change the course of your day. And if during the day you never find yourself or you scarcely find yourself praying or thinking on the Lord, but it's always thoughts of the world that are present, then that needs mortification. Now, clearly, you're going to need to have thoughts on the things that you are doing and so on. But the Lord has to be in all of it, right? We work hardly as unto the Lord. We think about what we're doing in light of his word. When there are difficulties, we pray, right? So we're always in this interchange in our day with the Lord. But if so much of our thoughts are on the world, and I'm always thinking, like, because you know you can multitask your thoughts. I know it. You can be there at the desk or at the sink, and you're amused in your mind about television shows. Or you're thinking about something else in this world. You can replace that with the Lord. You surely can. Second, consider your conversations. If your conversations, especially on the Lord's Day, are full of the world, then you know that your love for the world is overshadowing your love for Christ. And this is a struggle. Get it. It really is, right? When we speak to our brethren, there are things, too, that are uh, worthy of speaking of. You know, when we talk about how the course of their work week went, we do care about them, and we love them, and we want to know how we can pray for them. But the things of God... And the Lord himself ought to be more on our mind and on our heart. You know, still, often Christians are speaking about things like the movies on the Lord's Day and thinking about their favorite television shows or whatever else or where I'm going to go out to eat this week. You know, the world intrudes so often even on the Sabbath day. And so we need to ask ourselves, right, how often is the Savior and the things of God in our conversations? What actually excites us in our conversations? Is it to talk about the latest Hollywood blockbuster or is it to talk about what I have learned from the Word or the Puritans or something? What excites us? Where are our affections there? You remember in Malachi, God says there's a book of remembrance written for those who fear God and those who would speak of him. Let our conversations be rich with the Lord and not the world. Third, You need to ask yourself if you can let go of things of this world. This is a spiritual exercise. This is a meditation that I need to do very often and all of God's people should do very regularly. I, I take and I turn over in my mind, could I or would I give up anything in this world for the sake of following the Lord? And be very specific. Going over the things that are lawful and good even in your life, Right, the disciples, they, they resolved to forsake all to follow Jesus. Sometimes we love the world so much that if Jesus said, drop that thing, leave it behind, follow me, we would be tempted to say no. Consider all the things you love in this world and whether if Jesus said, get rid of it, whether you would. Now he doesn't call us to leave everything behind necessarily. Providentially, he does at times, doesn't he? There are many who've lost their homes. And that's really to the Christian who has lost their home recently. That is Jesus saying, leave that behind. But if the Lord did tell you to leave anything behind and drop it, he would be in his rights to do so. He told the rich young ruler, get rid of it all. He's in his rights to tell you that. Would you go away sorrowful? Here's some examples to spur mortifying activity. If the Lord said, you will have to give up your position at work to follow me, would you? If he said, you will have to give up this movie, this television show, would you? If the Lord said, you have to give up this device and your time on it, would you? If the Lord said, you will have to give up your friendship with that unbelieving person, would you? If the Lord said, give up this substance, give up this food, give up this location in the country, would you? If he said, 
even you'll have to walk away from unbelieving family in order to follow me? Would you? Or would you say that's too much? Would you look back like Lot's wife or be mournful? Friends, even lawful things in this world can take the place of God. Let's never be content to say, well, it's lawful, so I can indulge in it. Well, it might very well be that an inordinate love for something lawful has pushed God away. This is one of the best uses of the Sabbath day, isn't it? It shows us when there are things that are lawful in this world are taking the place of God. Fourth, discontentment shows you love the world. If you're upset that you do not have everything the world has to offer or you're tormented by the fact somebody else has something you do not, you are loving the world. And discontentment especially comes when you do not realize the treasure you have in Christ. I often think of Spurgeon's anecdote of the dowager in the cottage who takes her crust of bread and her glass of water, these meager things, and says, all this in Christ too. Fifth, consider your pursuits in life. Whatever you pursue with the greatest enjoyment, whatever you pursue most zealously, especially if it's more than the Lord and the things of God, whatever delights you more, those pursuits must be put in their proper place. Put whatever your pursuits are in their proper place under Jesus Christ. And how do you make decisions in life, especially big decisions? Do they tend towards the world or towards Christ? You read of that sorrowful accounting of Lot's decision making, that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. What is that? Pitching it towards the world. Right? When the big decision comes in life, where do you, how do you make your decision? Is it about what you can gain in this world? Or do you pitch your tent towards the city of God, towards heavenly Jerusalem? If it means even losing many things in this world, how do you make your decisions? Is it always going to be first, what is best for my career? What is best for my bank account? What is best for this, that, or the other thing? Or do I say what is best for for the kingdom of God, for the good of my soul and my children and my family. Worldliness comes into too many. There are many, when I was uh, in church planting in my prior denomination, there are many who had made decisions to move to places to pursue a lucrative career and then would cry out five years later, seeing their souls decimated with no place to worship God and say, will you plant a church here? My children are going apostate. They're walking away from the Lord. They don't want to worship him anymore. And they did it because they had, they could have a bigger house and a better chance to advance their career. What does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? And more than that, you have much heavenly treasure to lay up. You have this one life to live for the Lord and to advance his cause. And so our decisions ought to be made in view of that. Sixth, your pride. If you find that constantly your pride is being wounded, you think of the pride of life, when you take slight and offense to everything someone says about you or against you, especially when it is a godly rebuke, and friend, you're living as a worldling. In a sermon on 2 Samuel 6, Spurgeon exhorted his congregation, Brother, if any man thinks ill of you, do not be angry with him, for you are worse than he thinks you to be. If we would only have that mindset, that person doesn't know the half of what's in my heart. That's the truth. You and I are to find that receiving a godly rebuke should be delightful. And I have found that even uncharitable criticism of me often has a nugget of truth to be discovered if I would be humble about it. Okay, that person does not like me, 
but something that they are saying might be true. If your pride, though, is easily wounded, you are living as one who lives for the world. Seventh, and lastly, your coveting of the things you possess. I've covered this, so I'm just going to say this briefly. Would it destroy you to lose your home or your life savings if you would say, I have saved for decades and it's all wiped out? Would that destroy your soul? Or can you say in truth, having Jesus, I have everything? Ask yourself the question, if the Lord today took everything as he did with Lot, I mean with Job, could you say, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Have a loose grip on the things of the world and a tight grip on the Lord. Oh, with that then, seven ways for you to examine your Love of the world, let's go to our final head. We'll be brief here, vivification. So as we prepare for the supper, let us weigh our heart in the balance. On one side of the scale, our love for the world, and on the other, our love for Christ. And our pursuit is to make our love for Jesus outweigh our love for the world. And not just so that, you know, the scales come, children, and it just sort of ekes its way up, so that uh, Jesus Christ, uh, or it geeks its way down, so that Jesus Christ just barely outshadows the world. Now we want that side of the scale to come crashing down, ejecting whatever it is on the other side so that it's as though it's empty. That's the goal and that's the hope, especially as we seek his reviving work at the supper. Now if you're converted and you're born again, implanted in you is a love for Jesus. You know that. 1 Corinthians 16, 22 says, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha, that is, accursed. But you love him if you are born again. And what, if you have that love, even if it is very faint, even the, if it is as a, as, a, uh, as a smoking flax, that's a hopeful thing. And the Lord of heaven can blow on it and cause that love to increase and cause the love of the world to decrease. In fact, it's an assurance tonight that we are not accursed if we think of our love for Jesus, if it is not what it ought to be, but you want it to be what it ought to be. That should assure you that you are in a gracious state. Again, it's not the word is not, Peter, dost thou love me as I deserve to be loved? But do you love me? And so what you need to do in order to push out the world, the very best thing is, yes, we mortify our sin, right? We, we seek to be rid of our love for the world. But what did Jesus say? That if you send off an unclean spirit, it will return with seven even more wicked Right? This is the problem where you say, okay, I'm going to give this up. I'm going to give that up. I'm going to stop changing my behavior here, here, and there. But if you have not replaced it with the love for Christ, then it's going to be fruitless. And you're going to find that the last condition of your soul is worse than the first. And so don't ever say, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give up these things, but I'm not going to seek to love the Lord more. It is the sweetest duty of all, isn't it, Christian? To cultivate love and affection for him. It is your duty. I'd mentioned how even our affections are under the commandments of God, but you know the great commandment, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. You see, when the law of God is pressed upon us by the Lord Jesus Christ, it is positive and it is framed in terms of loving him. There are many ways to do that. But with communion, it's appropriate to stir your affections for the one who suffered for you. Remember this scripture, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians 10, 16. 
Now, Paul reminds you that in the sacramental actions of uh, blessing, breaking, they're in view of Christ's sufferings. God has said, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. When you think more and more for my transgression, for my sin, for my worldliness, the Lord was stricken. That his love and mercy was for me, the sinner there at the cross. And I am to grow in my love and my affection for my Savior with these thoughts. And I say, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what comes next? Sometimes we think on that first part. By whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. See, to think on the cross is to remember that I am crucified the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. And I need to put the world where it belongs, nailed on that cross with Christ. So when you think of Christ's sufferings this, these next few days, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you remember that the answer to that is that he was forsaken for my transgressions if I be a believer, crushed, bruised, bloodied, under the wrath of God Almighty, will you grow in esteem and love for this one? The world won't even be at your deathbed, but this one loved you to the death. This one will be there to receive you into eternal habitations. This one has given himself for you, Christian, and you are to gladly with full delight, put to death the world. Remember what the Lord has done. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You want the riches of the world? This one had come down made himself poor for your sake that you might have the riches of God and every blessing. Ask yourself, oh my soul, will the world love me like this? Will the world even cast a second look at me? The politician that I'm so enamored with, the company with all of its devices, the world's fashions, those people that I want to look at me, those worldlings, will they cast a second glance at me when I am perishing? And yet, the one that I was at enmity with in my sin laid down his life for me and gave himself for me. It's ridiculous that man loves that which hates him, like the devil who is a murderer. Child of God, we have to ask why our affection for this world is so great and our affection for Jesus is so small. So grow to love him more by meditating on his sufferings. Covet Christ, covet heaven. Seek the things of God more earnestly. And at the end of the day, and we'll close with this thought, beloved, our text says to love the world is irrational, right? The world passeth away and the lust thereof. Children, it is irrational and it is stupid to love that which does not endure. It is irrational and it is stupid because the world is going to pass away. And if you're attached to the world, which is what Lot's wife was, you perish with the world. When the fire comes down from heaven, you will be lost with it. But what does 17 say? But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now John Calvin mints no words. When a corrupt lust of this kind rules in man and so holds him entangled that he thinks uh, not of the heavenly life, he is possessed by a beastly stupidity. None of the things that you have put your affections on that are not Jesus himself will endure. 
Ask yourself, what will endure? What have I put my affections on? But we cast our heart's glance on Christ. I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go. Let go of the world. But if you found Christ, embrace him all the more, love him all the more, and do not let him go. Well, may the Lord help you then prepare to meet with him through his word and put away a love of the world. May the Lord bless this meditation. Amen. Let us arise for her and, and go to the Lord in prayer if able. <clears throat> o God of heaven, we confess before thee that the world has too much of our hearts. We plead, O God, that thou wouldst cause us to love Jesus more, that we would delight in our bridegroom, that we would look on the one whom we have pierced. We would mourn, but then also grow in love that he willingly came down to give his life for us and that the world is truly crucified on that cross that we would live as those who are dead to the world, that the world would not have any pull on our hearts, that we would live for thee. Oh, Father, we have no desire to be at enmity with thee. Instead, we want the sweetness of thy love, of thy heavenly embrace, of peace in our soul that passeth knowledge, of the love of Christ, which is delightful, and desirous to those who have tasted it. And so we pray, Father, that as we are a people who struggle, that thou wouldst help us in our struggle, that the children especially, who are now only learning of the world and how the world is, and are at times enticed by it, that thou wouldst keep their heart for thee, and that we would have our hearts hedged about from the love of uh, the world, that thou wouldst reserve our hearts for the Lord of heaven. Help us to uh, reflect on our lives this upcoming days approaching the table and that we might repent and put away worldliness and find the blessing of the love of Christ at the table. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.